There we go. Now we're going. Okay. Now we're going to try to get to uh, at least some of chapter 23. All right. So we had filters in uh, in our last um, class. So we went and we took a, a resistor and a capacitor and we had some, some input thing here. And at low frequencies, this guy is an open. And at high frequencies, this guy is a short. The capacitors are short at high frequencies. So we, we have some thing. Uh, we have a low pass filter, something that does something like that. Um, at the 3 dB down point, 3 dB down point, we have some critical frequency, and that critical frequency was what? 1 over 2 pi RC, maybe. I'm just making that up, but that's probably right. And then we, then we could do the same thing. We could go and put the resistor here and the capacitor there, and the same thing's going to happen, except now we're not going to have a, a low-pass filter. And at, um, at low frequencies, this guy's a shore, is an open, so my uh, everything goes through, and at higher frequency, I go down. I have some critical frequency again at, at, uh, at the 3 dB down point, and my slope of the curve is minus 20 dBs per decade. And, and that's what we did. And we did the same thing with an inductor getting low pass and high pass filters, and then we put them together, inductors and capacitors, and have notch filters, or we had band pass filters. Okay. But in, in all cases, um, the amplification we, we could get out of this thing, we'd never get anything out other than one, or less than one. So I've got a resistor, I'm going to lose some of the, the voltage across the resistor, I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to get that point 0.9 of the signal coming across the maximum. Okay, so now today we're going to deal with active filters where I'm going to have the same effect. I'm going to have low pass, high pass, band pass, notch filters, but I'm going to go and have them active so that I get 100 dB of, of gain as part of the filter. Oh, much better idea. So these are uh, a tuned amplifier. I've got some center line frequency. I got a, a frequency one, cutoff frequency one and two at the 3 dB down point. I've got a bandwidth going across there. Ideally, it's just something that looks like that, but practically, I've got something with slopes on both sides. And now I can tune my amplifier to a Pacific band or an Atlantic band if you'd rather have that. Uh, we normally don't have any in ocean bands, but that's okay because it's a little warm there. What? Anyway, the, uh, but that's what I'm going to do. And now I'm going to have a, a voltage gain of 100 or 200 or 300. And I'm going to be able to amplify whatever it is I'm doing. So now I've got some uh, roll-off rate versus the bandwidth. So I've got some bandwidth between my, my two critical frequencies, 40 kilohertz. And then I've got some stopping distance on both sides. And I've got some bandwidth on both sides, halfway between where I'm, I'm stopping the, uh, the guy from coming off. So I've got a, um, a bandwidth that goes at the minus 3 dB point, And then I've got a practical bandwidth where it's probably going to be used. Then I've got a Q for quality, so my, my central frequency uh, divided by whatever the bandwidth is is going to be give me some quality of this guy. If, if my quality is, is 100, then that'd be good. I've got a very thin band of frequencies that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be looking for. So in, in the submarine force, we have uh, an emergency announcement buoy that we release in case the submarine is sunk. We take that buoy and we go and we weld it to the hull when we get underway. The only time we have it so it can actually be released 
is doing a C trials. But if we were out on a, a normal deployment, it can't be deployed. Isn't that convenient? Now, why, why did we do that? Well, we'll get to that later. But that buoy is going to send out a particular frequency message, whatever that frequency is. We have arrays in, up in, in um, Maine that's set up for the sole purpose of listening for that frequency and getting a direction to that frequency. Because we don't need to know what the message is. We know what the message is. Okay, and th this guy will go up and, and transmit for uh, for an hour before he runs out of power, and that's perfectly okay. Um, on C trials, this guy's on a timer. He's on a, 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 a 60 minute timer. Whenever the watch standard goes by, he resets the timer. If it gets down to 10 minutes to go, it starts beeping. At five minutes to go, it starts beeping louder and faster. At one minute to go, it starts making lots of noise, saying, I'm really going to go. Okay, somebody pay attention to me. And then if he's ever released, then uh, the Commodore is calling the wives together in, the, in the, uh, the chapel to say that their husbands are all dead. So we uh, don't want to release the buoy. That's not the purpose. Okay. Um, in a war situation or just normal ops, you, you don't want it released either. Uh, we have solstice arrays covering the whole Atlantic. You can't implode a submarine. It makes too much noise on the way down. Everybody who wants to know will know where it is. All they'd have to do is just go look. Anyway, the cue, the roll off. So I, I can make this with a, if I have several acres of antennas, I can tune the antenna array so that it's only going to listen for that frequency. And when some FM station comes on, it won't matter. It can't hear it. All right, my, uh, I have some central frequency, frequency center uh, cutoff one, frequency cutoff two, the square root of it. I have some average frequency. I add them together and divide by two. Um, why are those not going to be the same number? Well, be, because the, this guy's going to be so much bigger in magnitude than the other guy. If I take the average, I'm going to swing swing too far one way. So let's say I got something like this, and let's say that this guy is at uh, 10 hertz, and this guy is at 1,000 hertz. Then the average is going to be what? Um, frequency average. Um, 505, 505 hertz. But the center frequency, cut off uh, the center frequency square root of those two, um, square root of uh, 10 to the fourth, is going to be 100 hertz. So that's a, a huge difference. We normally have the, uh, when, when I draw the curve, I'm normally on a log scale. And on a log scale, um, that makes the x axes linear. So there's as much difference between 10 and 100 as there is between 100 and 1,000, as there is between 1,000 and 10,000, because I'm on a long scale. What's that all about? All right. So active filters uh, with operational amplifiers. I have some gain. I got some 3 dB cutoff. I have low pass, high pass, band pass and band stop, also known as notch. So someone's jamming my radio system, I throw in a notch filter. Um, when, you, when you go, you're, uh, you're going to get cable TV put into the house, and you're like me, you're too cheap, you're not going to pay for HBO. Okay, So I don't pay for it. I, I, it's been in the house free for, uh, in the 17 years I've lived in the house, it's been in the house free for over five. How do I get it so that, how, how does it, what does the technician do so that you don't get HBO? All right, put the filter, the filter in, it locks it. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. He puts in a notch filter at the frequency of the HBO station, and now maybe you can hear it, maybe it's, yeah. fu maybe it's fuzzy, but it's not going to come in nice. Yes? Can you do the opposite to it? Like if they add a filter to it, do you 
filtrate that? Can you do the opposite though? You probably could. Yes. I don't see why not. How do you figure that out though? Like, for instance, <laughs> All right, so I can I can have mo I have a pole. My filter has a pole. Every time I have an RC circuit associated with a filter, that adds another pole. If I have a first order filter, I have one lousy pole, and my roll off is 20 decades per minute. If I have a second order filter, I have two RC circuits associated with it. I have two poles. I get a roll off of 40 decades per minute. If I have a third order, I have three poles, I have 60, as you see the pattern there? 60 decades per minute, to per de uh, decibels per decade. How much is 60 decibels? Anybody know? Let's say 60 decibels. Right, a decibel is um, 20 log voltage in divided by voltage out. I divide by 20, 3 uh, decibels is log voltage in divided by voltage out. Raised as powers of 10, voltage in is equal to 1,000 voltage out. Voltage out is equal to 1,000 voltage in. So if I have a 60 dB roll-off rate, then we're talking about 1,000 difference. If I'm talking about a um, 40, then I'm talking about 100 difference. If I'm talking about a 20 dBs, then I'm talking about a 10 difference. So 20, 60, 20, 40, 60, 10 times, amplification of 10 times, amplification of 100 times, amplification of 1,000 times, difference. Butterworth, Chevy Check, and Bessel filters. Isn't that lover? Just what we, just what we wanted to know. Another set of vocabulary words that can't be spelled or said properly. Isn't that wonderful? Butterworth is obviously a British guy. Bessel's a British guy. Chevy Chek is one of our Russian counterparts. <coughs> hey, they all have filters. They all do something a little different. So here my, my normal filter looks like that. My Chevy Chek filter is going to have a bow in it before it starts going down. So now I've got my Butterworth filter on top of my Chevy Check filter, and there's the Bessel filter in black. Bessel, have you ever heard of Bessel functions? Well, that's good. Maybe, maybe in your second or third differential equation class, you'll get the Bessel functions. Um, very nice guy, he gave us a lot of really hard math. Uh, but it's with the Bessel functions that he developed that we figured out how to control our nuclear power plants. So when, when we have a nuclear power plant, the, um, well, it doesn't matter. Maybe it does. Doesn't matter? I don't know. Um, what happens is that, is that I had this uranium atom, and it splits. And it gives me another... Um, neutron. A neutron goes into the uranium and it splits. These, these things that it makes, sometime in the future, one of them will let out a neutron. That's called a delayed neutron. So um, somewhere around 1% of all neutrons caused by this uranium splitting are delayed. Some of them are delayed um, less than a second, some are delayed a, a, a one to two seconds, some are delayed up to 10 minutes. Uh, they're in, in our approximation of how a nuclear power works, we've split them up into six different groups. And then the reason the civilian nuclear power plant can't blow up as a bomb 
is because we never get prompt critical. We never get critical enough so that um, the uh, delayed neutrons don't matter. The delayed neutrons are what we're controlling the reactor power at. Okay, in a nuclear weapon, the delayed neutrons won't make any difference. The weapon has already blown up before the first delayed neutron shows up because it happens in 10 to the minus 11th seconds. Okay, so that, that's, that's the way that is. So it takes 10 to the minus 11th second for one neutron or one uranium to hit the next one. All that's going to be gone, happen very quickly. Uh, some neutron that happens to show up a minute later is going to be totally irrelevant to the explosion. Okay, so that's how we keep um, our civilian reactor plants, our naval reactor plants, from being bombs. They physically can't be a bomb. No matter how, I, how fast I can pull the rods out, I can't pull them out fast enough to get the power level high enough to be prop critical. Right? The power level is still dependent on the delayed neutrons coming in later. And when I shut down the plant, the same thing is true. So I have delay heat. I shut down the plant. I drop my rods. My power level goes down. Now I, have, I still have delay heat going on because the nuclear reaction is still going on caused by the those uh, delayed neutrons. Anyway, back to where we were. Chevy check Bessel. Yeah, but without Bessel, we never would have known how to control a nuclear power plant. And uh, he died before we had the first one, but that didn't matter. Sort of like George Boolean. You know, he had Boole made Boolean algebra in 1820, died off, and then, oh, we use Boolean algebra. Isn't that great? So, single pole, low pass filter, uh, the critical frequency, 1 over 2 pi RC. Did I get that right earlier? I did. What a bummer. All right, so I, uh, I have a single pole guy. I, I have some gain across my operational amplifier. I have some single pole guy. I have some gain caused by the operational amplifier. Both of those circuits are basically the same. This guy I have unity gain. Why have an active filter if I'm going to have unity gain? Well, I might not want to. I might not want to drain power from the voltage in, right? So this guy's going to. This guy's not going to take any power away from the input, and this guy's going to give power the operational amplifier. So that might be okay, but I'd rather have a hundred gain. Oh, a Sheldon key low pass filter with a roll off of, of 40 dB. Isn't that great? Um, so I have two sets of RC guys, and I have some cutoff frequency, 2 pi square root of all the guys multiplied together. And my, the resistance that's sitting over here causing the feedback path, um, I don't use it. Not used in my calculation. Uh, damping factor. Okay, now think about for a moment. I've got this spring, and I'm going to pull it down, and I'm going to let it go, and it's going to bounce up and down, up and down, up and down. What's going to cause it to stop going up and down? Some damping that's happening in the spring. So if I if I take if I take the spring and pull it down and let go of it, it's going to do that. But if I take the same spring and I, and I add 10 kilograms to it, and I pull it down the same amount and I let it go, now it's not going to do this anymore. It's going to do this and get to an equilibrium position much sooner. It's been damped. The same thing's going to happen in an electronic, in an electronic circuit. When I tweak on the circuit, it's going to start bouncing back and forth, and then it, it's depending on whether I have it damped or not, we'll have it go and zooming up and blowing my fuse, or dying off to nothing, or coming to some equilibrium. So my damping factor is what I'm going to use to uh, to damper it out. In a Butterworth filter, my damping factor is um, 1.414. Anybody know what that number is? Yeah, square root of 2. So that's the square root of 2 sitting there. 
And I control it by my feedback resistors is how I'm going to control the damping factor. All right, so here's a high pass filter. Um, what the heck? Pole, one pole and a two pole guy. Looks like I'm just uh, I'm just going and adding components for the heck of it, right? So low pass filters, uh, depending on whether I'm one pole or two pole, three pole will have an entirely different equation associated with it. Uh, my closed loop gain is the same because it's just called by my my feedback uh, capacitors. Um, we're limited to 1,582, or is that a point? Yeah, 4 dB is going to be quite a bit. Um, high pass filters. Um, my equations look like they're the same, except I've, I've changed the position. So if I look here, I've got, I got a capacitor there, I have two here. All right, I move back to the last slide. My capacitor is there and there. So I, I've changed the positions of my capacitors and my resistors on my input path. And that, that doing that changes me from a high pass to a low pass guy. And why don't I have control of squat? All right, be that way. All right, high pass filter. Two stage band pass filter. So now I've got a um, um, a low pass filter followed by a high pass filter, and I've got some blocking capacitor between them to block off any DC that might be happening. And I, I calculate the the uh, first critical frequency. I calculate the second critical frequency. I find the bandwidth using it. I find the central frequency using it. I find the Q using it. So I, I've now increased my math skills by a factor of two or three because I've had to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Um, multiple feedback bandpass filters. So I, I've got, I've got a, a capacitor in the feedback path. I've got a capacitor not in the feedback path. Um, and now I've got a two-stage filter that is a bandpass. Um, if I have that, then I have a different, different set of calculations I have to do. What a bummer. I hope I remember that. Everybody got those memorized? Yeah. All right, good. And then um, I can calculate my, uh, my uh, frequencies. I can cal calculate my cues. If my Q is greater than or equal to 2, how would I know that if I didn't calculate it? Then I, I calculate my C1 and C2 one way. If I'm less than 2, then I calculate it a different way. Um, and I've got some gain. Feedback filter, 2 times whatever. I'm. Well, band pass and notch filters. Uh, we want to block all the frequencies in the, in the blocking thing so I don't get them. Okay, so... Um, I want, I want. Let's see. What would I want to do? How would I want to do that at home? I can't think of any good reason to do that at home. But oh, I got a neighbor that um, has his own AM radio station, and it's transmitting illegal. You know, and I want to block it. <laughs> yeah, that'll work. Here's a, a multi-stage notch filter. So there's my. Let's see. Here's my low pass filter, and here's my high pass filter, and someplace in between I'm throwing away the stuff, and that makes this a notch filter. Multiple feedback notch filter. Now I've got, I've got it down to one lousy uh, operational amplifier now. So that's good. I, I guess I just you know went to my workbench and threw things together and see what happened to them, and then put my name on them, right? Um, so here we have an audio crossover network. 
I have a, a really cool woofer that I want all the low frequencies to go to. And then I got a tweeter that I want the, the high frequencies to go to. So I make a crossover network, so I only send the low frequencies to the woofer and only the high frequencies to the tweeter. And then uh, my woofer is going, boo, 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 the tweeter. Yeah, something like that. Uh, so here we are, an operational amplifier. I have the input signal. I'm sending the low frequencies that way. I'm sending the high frequencies this way. And I don't have to listen to that dreadful alto, right? Because I'm going to block her off. I'm going to tune it so I don't hear any alto. Is that the way it works? Or did I get rid of the tenor? I forget. Yeah. One or the other. Um, here's a, a, a graphic anal, uh, um equalizer so I'm gonna have a 10 channel graphic e equalizer showing me what frequencies are coming out so uh, I have one one pass one band pass one another band pass and I have multiple channels of it um, active filter applications okay we're gonna filter out noise from my guitar well that's easy just pull the plug on it I can do that, right? So here we go. We have uh, now we're gonna. Oh, we're into oscillators now. Okay, so we're out of filters into oscillators. Now, why do I need an oscillator for? Well, in all my telecommunication systems, I'm gonna they're being transmitted at some frequency, and it's a carrier frequency, and then I have the information superimposed on top of that carrier. So. I've got a radio station at uh, 1040 kilohertz in Des Moines. Is it 1040 kilohertz or is it 1020? WHO out of Des Moines. Um, I think it's 1020 kilohertz. So I have a, a, a local oscillator <coughs> oscillating at 1020 kilohertz, and then I throw on some amplitude modulation on top of it, which would be the voice, the music, everything else going on. But I have, to, I have to have a stable frequency in order to be able to do that. Otherwise, my AM radio stations would go all, all over the place. So there was a time in the um, 1920s where radio stations were allowed to broadcast on a frequency of plus or minus 100 kilohertz because that's the best we could do. And then there was a time when we, we cranked it down to, to 50 kilohertz, and then we cranked it down to 10. Now we got it down, digital digital systems have it cranked down to a whole lot less. But I need an oscillator. So I've got, I got some amplifier, I've got some feedback network that's giving me an oscillator. Um, some trigger has to trigger the oscillation, but once it starts, it should, still, it should go forever and ever. Uh, <coughs> crystals are cool. CB radios in the 50 had crystals that they used for their channels. They had a channel one, two, three, or four. You had those channels because you had the crystals for those channels. <coughs> now we do it electronically. What the heck is that word? Barkhausen. Say that fast all the time. Barkhausen criteria. You have some attenuation factor associated with your lo local oscillators. As long as it's less than one, the oscillator is going to fade out in a few cycles, so it's too damped. If I'm greater than <coughs> one, then the oscillator is, is, is uh, self-driving and continues to saturation forever and ever. So here we have a, a situation where I'm dying off. Here's a situation where I'm clipped. When I'm one, I got a real nice signal, which is what I want, a real nice signal. So here's a phase shift oscillator. I'm using uh, three RC circuits to produce a feedback and uh, causing me to rarely use because they're extremely unstable. Way to go, author. Why do we even look at them? Um, now we're going to call that a, a Wien bridge, or we're going to call that a Wien bridge. Uh, I'm going to go with German and call it Wien, or are we going to go with English and call it Wien? Hmm. What, what's the pleasure? 
Ween. Ween. Okay, we'll go with English. Go with Ween. Okay. Bridge oscillator. This is more commonly used at low frequencies. Um, so there it is. I throw in two diodes going two different ways, and now I have I can change my frequency by by having a variable uh, guy there. I got some phase shift thing. Wien bridge oscillator uh, giving me positive feedback. So uh, one guy's doing one guy, somebody else is doing something else. I have some some frequency that I'm oscillating at. That's how I'm doing that. Negative feedback circuit, yeah, I guess so. The diodes are acting as clippers, keeping the uh, whatever, yeah. Frequency limits, anything below one megahertz. If I want to be above a megahertz, I'm not going to use one. And there it is, isn't it lovely? Coal pits, coal pits oscillator, discrete. Uh, LC amplifier pair <coughs> resistor. So I got an LC circuit tank. We call this a tank circuit. And uh, we're going to throw in a, a um, transistor and we end up getting a frequency up. Common emitter thingy. You get to see all this again naturally. Oscillators in your telecommunication class. Won't that be exciting? So here's a feedback network. Um, my capacitors are charging. My capacitors are discharging. The capacitor is 100. The inductor is 180 degrees out of phase, and the voltage you're going back forth, back forth, back forth, back forth. Maybe there's some attenuation, and maybe there's not. Could have some gains, some central frequencies, some operating frequency. Discrete LC oscillations. Coal pits again, oscillator. Now I've got a transformer on the other side. I'm taking my voltage out on the transformer. What is an RFC? Royal Flying Cross. Um, RFC. RFC. RF, radio frequency, choke. RFC, radio frequency, choke. It's an inductor. Normally it's variable. What, what does a choke do? That's right, it takes the air out of here, right? So it's something that removes the signal. It's a choke. Oh, Hartley oscillators. Feedback network uses tapped inductors in a single capacitor. Well, at least Hartley was British. All right, so I've got my inductor. I got it grounded in the middle. Uh, I got it grounded in the middle. I, I only use one capacitor instead of two. And uh, isn't that lovely? Clap capacitor. Sounds like some disease, the clap, right? Um, is it clap on, clap off? Yeah, that's what it is. Simply a cold pump that's oscillated where I've added another capacitor C3. There's C3 right there. So somebody got his name put on it something because he, he, put the, he put it together wrong and it worked. Yeah, pretty much. Armstrong oscillator uses a transformer to achieve 180 phase shift required for oscillation. All right. That's good. Now let's move back. See if I can move back. I couldn't move back last time. Here it is. What does this dot mean on the transformer? I got a dot there and a dot there. That seems kind of weird. I didn't, don't remember dots before. You remember dots? That's telling you how the transformer is wound. So if I have a dot there and a dot there, that means whatever the phase is coming in one side is going to be the same phase going the other way. Okay, so if I'm dot here and dot there, I'm in the same. My phases are the same on both sides of the of the of the transform. If I have a dot on top, a dot on bottom, that means I'm 180 degrees out of phase coming out of the <coughs> transformer. Okay, now in in the world, the real world. Uh, a transformer doesn't have to have just one um, set of coils. 
a transformer can have many sets of coils in it. So um, we had, on our submarine, we had operational amplifiers that had multiple sets of coils. Uh, there'd be one for feedback, one for positive feedback, one for negative feedback, one for something else. And in fact, we controlled the nuclear power plant using magnetic amplifiers. And these would be magnetic amplifiers, multiple coils going in, multiple ways to control what we had coming out. Crystal controlled oscillators. Well, you have a piezoelectric effect across the crystal. As the voltage goes up, as I, as I squeeze the, pe the crystal, I get electricity. But if I put electricity across it, it squeezes. And then when it lets go, it lets go the, uh, lets go the electricity, the current. And so I, I end up with a, a, a crystal that's going to oscillate and depend on on um, the frequency that I have it set for, the manufacturer can manufacture it pretty precisely, can give me whatever frequency I want. So my crystal oscillator looks like this. If I was going to think about it in electrical terms, its equivalent circuit would look like that. And I have some frequency response. And I, I would be oscillating right there. Crystal oscillators, okay, I've got a, uh, who cares about all that stuff? Not very much. All right. You have an overtone mode of your crystal oscillator. So if I have a pipe organ and I put some, some air to it, it's going to give me a frequency. Um, how many frequencies did you just hear? We have a bunch. Yeah. Um, I'm almost like uh, I'm only one, but I'm close. Um, there, are, there are other frequencies that are set up because I have a frequency going on. So a fundamental frequency happens, and then you're going to have other frequencies, um, twice that, three times that, four times that, five times that, at different levels. The same thing is happening here. My crystal oscillator is going to have a, an overtone going on associated with it, uh, many other frequencies. So if, if it's a 10 kilohertz, 10 megahertz crystal, it's going to give me 10 megahertz, and that's going to be my best frequency. But I'm going to have overtones of, of 20K, 20 meg, 30 meg, 40 meg, 50 meg. And I might use one of those overtones. So as a violin, uh, violin player, uh, when I'm playing my instruments, the, the high notes are overtones. And normally I hold my finger down on the, on the hold the, the, the string, the change the size of the string to change my tone. But if I want a higher tone that I can produce that way, I don't press it down. I just barely get close to it. And now I change. <coughs> the way the string is vibrating and get an overtone. If I do it right, it's pretty. If I don't, it's really shitty. So here's a Cole Pitts oscillator or a Harley clap or can be modified. Any of those guys can be modified. And I've thrown in a crystal to help out maintain a stable frequency. Oh, we're all done. Isn't that great? Now it's time to do the homework problems. Uh, anybody bother to look at the homework problems? Let's see. Hmm. 8.37. I think we do should do one homework problem. So yeah, we'll, we'll see how it goes. That's what we'll do. So I'm going to do uh, number five. So number five, page 837. Hmm. Calculate the roll-off frequency, the closed-loop voltage gain for the filter shown below. All right. Is this a, a uh, inverting guy or a non-inverting guy? Okay, so 
the, the voltage gain of a non-inverting amplifier is um, RF1 divided by RF2 plus 1. So I will do that first. It is? Really? Yeah, I'm afraid so. 15K divided by 30K plus 1, 1.5. That's not very much. Oh, wrong circuit. Well, there's a front row going to tell me I'm looking at the wrong circuit. All right, trying again. 100K divided by 10K plus 1 is 11. Okay, so I've got the, the closed loop voltage gain. Now I want to find the cutoff frequency. All right, so frequency cutoff 1 over 2 pi RC. Mm -hmm. 1 over 2 pi 100K. 0 0.01 microfarad. Okay, um, right, before we do that in our head, oh, I know, we're going to pull out a calculator, I remember. 2 times pi times 100 doubly 3 times 0 0.01 doubly minus 6 equals raised to the minus 1. Uh, well, the cutoff frequency is 159 hertz. Okay, so now looking at this guy here, we see that we don't really have to be done with the rest of the homework problems until after my birthday. Anybody know when my birthday is? All right. So we're going to ask some other questions. Uh, three factorial. How, what is that? 3 times 2 times 1, which is 6. Okay. Uh, 4 factorial, what's that? 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is uh, 24. Okay. So um, 5 factorial, what's that? 120. Okay. So what is 4? double factorial and what is 5 double factorial? 48 oh. uh, 4 double factorial a double factorial means I'm just multiplying the evens if I'm even is 8 and a double factorial of an odd guy means I'm only multiplying odd guys which is 15 <coughs> Yeah, uh, everybody with me? No. All right, no one's seen a double factorial in their life, right? No. Nope, nope. Okay, first time. The math department hi hid from you the half quadratic formula. They're hiding from you double factorial notation. Okay, no problem. I understand that. All right, uh, anybody have a TI-89 uh, calculator out there? You got one? TI-89 oh, calculator. All right. Yeah. I want, I want to know what, I don't know what 3.5 factorial is. Decimals. Do you use this one? What is it? Error. The inspired graphic. I have no idea. I'm, I'm, I'm only, I only know it works on TI-89s. Mine says error. Yours says error? 3.5 factorial and it says error. All right, so that's hosed. All right. So no one's calculator is going to do 3.5 factorial for me? Bummer. Well, clearly, the, the answer has to be between 6 and 24, right? And, uh, does it not? 
Yeah. So 11.63. Right, so you got 11.63. And what type of calculator do you have? A TI-84 plus? Yeah. Doesn't that just torque you off that it actually would do it? All right. So, you do? Yeah. You do? Does it does it do 3.5 factorial? I'm sure it does. All right. All right. So 3.5 three factorial is 3.5 times 2.5 times 1.5 times the square root of pi. Is it? I don't know. Maybe it's only 2.5, 1.5 times the square root of pi. Let's see, 3.5 times 2.5 times 1.5. All right. So it's probably only that, 2.5, 2.5. 1.5 times square root of pi. No, that's not right either. Oh, I, how about 2, 3 times 2 times the square root of pi? Three times 2 times Square root yes, of pi. I yeah, I think I think that might be closer. Ten point six three. Anyway, so we have a way to get fractional um, thingies <laughs> in our in our factorial notation. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, sort of like your checking account. Yeah. My Your calculator is broke. All right. But the only place I've ever seen the square root of 5 ever is in, um, in, not in uh, fractional notations of, of factorial. Ever, ever. Okay, well, with that, we will go Control, Alt, 